gang. We're here in the village of Kirsalara. Look on your map. Look at the yellow cloud in the bottom right hand corner. You see the word Kirsalara? Kilo Echo Echo Romeo, etc. That's where we are. That village no longer exists. Right? It was blown away in 1917. That's where we are. Map oriented this way. You to put us in the picture? So we're standing right at the corner of the gas cloud, hitting a picture out that way. You have the 87th Territorial and the 45th Algerian that are in the line. Gas attack comes through. They evaporate on the afternoon of the 22nd, and they basically just come this way. Germans follow behind over the evening. They've advanced a long way. They start to slow down by the time they get to around this line. As it becomes clear to the Allies that there's a big problem because there's basic Canadians are a couple kilometers up that way where the division is in the original line and there is nothing between where the Canadians are and Ypres. There's a big fucking gap. So the night of the 22nd into the 23rd, a number of counterattacks are launched. The first one being into Kitchener's Wood that we just passed. 10th and 16th Battalion go into there. They actually have a fair amount of success. They actually clear the wood, but by the time the morning is, they're way out from the troops. They have to retreat back to more or less the land this area, St. Julia. First thing on the morning of the 23rd, if you look toward the bottom of, uh, just above Ypres, you might see the, the 1st and 4th Division going up towards Hilltop Ridge Mount, uh, and uh, Turco Farm. 1st and 4th Battalion attack in there at about 5.30 in the morning. They get blown to smithereens and don't get within about 300 yards of the enemy. Three or 400 yards and they get blown to the smithereens. Um, at this point the, in the morning, the 23rd, the uh, Gettys Detachment, a British unit, British composite unit, I guess, they're thrown in the line between Ypres and St. Julian. Basically do whatever they can to plug the gap. Get troops in there, do something. Um, that goes on all through the 23rd. By, uh, by the morning of the 24th, um, the Germans are now actually preparing to attack through this area, all into St. Julian, along with the actual gas attack, which hits the eight, what's known as the apex, where the 13th, 15th Battalion are gassed, just up that way a little ways, um, and they have another gas attack on the morning of the 24th. It's all on the other maps. At the same time that's happening, as that gas attack goes in, the Germans launch a massive offensive into this area, which is the battle for St. Julian, and you get a... What is it? The Hulls? The Hull Brigade Detachment, whatever it is. Lots of British guys. What remains of the Canadian Division that's available? Keep in mind, most of the brigade, most of the three brigades are up still in the line. It's only the 1st Brigade, which is still in the reserve. And half of that's already been mauled at Hilltop Ridge. Um, so Julian rages for the next afternoon, two days, around that time. And it's just a mad dash trying to create some sort of defensive line in and around this area. Eventually, the apex will end up being pushed back as the Canadians gradually get overrun and pushed back and they start to collapse in and around this area as they move back that way into the GHQ line. And that happens over the course of a couple of days. <coughs> Please remember this as you grow older and wiser, as you can appreciate now, the battlefield is being built over. All right? Back then, standing here, you could see forever. Now, closed in. As I mentioned on the way up on the top left side of the road are all the larger ridges dominating the Canadian position on this side of the St. John Road. Right. Take that away. Understand. If you're going to make a very serious, detailed study of this battle, it's very confusing. Those of you who read the blurb in the, in the Canadian official history understand that it's, it's, it's action, reaction, counterattack, what day are we, where are we, etc. It's a confusing battle. It's the most difficult, the most confusing, right, and the most mobile battle we fight. We fight before Amiens, and that's 1918, three years from now, three years from this battle, okay? This is where all the movement stalls. 
This is where trench routine becomes, sorry, trench warfare becomes the dominant mode. We only regain the mobility we see here three years later. Very important. Right? So you have to understand that we go into this action as trained soldiers, trained in the Napoleonic sense, where there's lots of maneuver and lots of movement, and the division does it well. Does it very well. Understand also that in this battlefield, you've only got two ways of giving an order to your subordinates. You must go there and deliver it yourself, or sorry, three ways, have someone deliver a written order or using the phone. And the signalers in this division are laying wire all the time and it's being burst by German artillery. So this, this is a, a maneuver that really is being mounted at the platoon and company level where officers and NCOs are getting on with it, are getting on with it because they have to. In the absence of orders, you do something. Remember, the division has been in the line before. It's been in the line in Armentieres and in a place called Fleurbex. It's seen the Battle of Neufchâtel, Neufchapel. It has seen the British not do what they're supposed to do and, and ruin an opportunity to penetrate the German front line and, and, and let, let the Battle of Neufchapel uh, get lost. All right? because they simply didn't move for five hours. So there's this feeling, there's this feeling that you gotta get on with it, you gotta move, and in the absence of orders, you gotta do something, right? For which the Canadian psyche is exceedingly well adapted. Right? So that's the essence of the battle. The big players in this battle are the 3rd Brigade, sorry, it's the entire 1st Division, of course, but the 3rd Brigade is left forward. It defends on this side of the highway for about 2,000 or two, two kilometers inland. If you look, if you look, you'll see the Paul Capel Cathedral on the skyline. Right? You see the spire. We're deployed just in front of that and inwards into the salient. The 13th Battalion is left forward, Black Watch of Montreal, a regiment of where the officers are aristocrats and the soldiers are. Um, are from Verdun, another working class neighborhoods of Montreal. It is the most British, if you will, of the battalions in that work is divided, positions are divided by class structure. This doesn't last after the battle, but the first division goes in with a mixture of battalions like this, city battalions and country battalions, right? Rural battalions. And after this battle, that fundamental characteristic of the first division is gone. 6,000 casualties out of 20,000 soldiers engaged. Here, right where we're standing, the Black, a Black Watch machine gun team is deployed to cover the retreat of an artillery battery commanded by Krerer, who's going to command the Canadian Army in the, first, in the second, second World War. They're deployed to cover that and to stop the Germans coming in because they're pouring through Landsmark and they're heading towards the canal, which you've seen. Right? The machine gun detachment is commanded by a corporal Fisher. He's killed. He wins the VC. And that entire Black Watch machine gun platoon, only one soldier is left, and he is captured and goes in captivity. His name is Holdway. His great grandson is here with us today. Who was he? Uh, so, my great grandfather, uh, Henry Holdway, was like uh, Major War said, he's a machine gunner, uh, the 13th Battalion of the Black Watch out of Montreal. Um, I have photos if you guys want to see. Um, he was in part of the. Uh, So their machine gun section held off a German or held off the Allied retreat for three days. Uh, held off, uh, eventually they ran out of ammunition.
food from the uh, German soldiers who would come and raid the farms near the end of the war because they were starving. So we helped them hide food in exchange for that. Uh, in exchange for that. Uh, at the end of 1918, he released uh, my great grandfather, who, out of his entire battalion, was the only one who actually, out of his entire machine gun section who was captured, was the only person who survived. Uh, yeah, that's Last thing I want, I want to tell you, the Grafenstaffel Ridge figures very prominently in the history of the 1st Division, the history of the Canadian Corps. The Grafenstaffel, the Grafenstaffel Ridge, to give you another example of a very shallow terrain feature, is right there in front of you. You see where that yellowish field ends and the green begins? You see the slope? As you bend down, as you go down on hands and knees, you'll see it. That's a, that's a ridge. Now I know it's not a ridge in Canada, right? It doesn't jump out at you. But these small movements of terrain throughout the First World War battlefields make enormous differences. You gotta grip them, understand them if you wanna understand the battle. Right? It's another example of using imagination. It's not gonna leap out at you, you gotta find it. Now, obviously you're gonna ask, how come this, this terrain is dominant vis-a-vis uh, -vis this side of the road? Well, again, when you're down on your chest firing your rifle, it sure as hell is. And it gets more dominant, if you will, as, we, as you move towards the Yizu Canal. All right? The water table is six inches below our feet. The water has nowhere to go. Remember that when we get to the Passchendaele battlefield. The place does not drain. Right? Once it rains, it stays there till the sun gets rid of it. Okie doke. Good. So now we're going to go and see the brooding soldier. Take a look at that. The time now is quarter to ten.